CRISPR is one of the most exciting new gene therapy tools of modern medicine. In this conversation, Dr. Samarth Kulkarni, CEO of CRISPR Therapeutics, speaks with Edward Tentoff, Managing Director of Piper Sandler. Hello, my name is Edward Tentoff, and I'm a Senior Biotechnology Analyst at Piper Sandler. I'm honored to participate in the Fifth International Vatican Conference. CRISPR Therapeutics is the leading developer of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing medicines. Based on the discovery of Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Gwadna, who were both awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry last year, CRISPR has demonstrated the curative potential of CTX001 in sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. Additionally, CRISPR is advancing a pipeline of three gene-edited CAR-T therapies to treat cancer and has a rich preclinical pipeline behind these therapies. With us from CRISPR today is my good friend, Sam Kulkarni, CEO of CRISPR Therapeutics. Sam, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So pretty incredible that the Nobel Prize was awarded just last year for this technology. Perhaps you can start off by telling us how CRISPR-Cas9 works. The discovery and development of CRISPR-Cas9 is a remarkable story. It turns out that bacteria have developed over millions of years a pair of molecular scissors that they use to inactivate viruses and protect themselves against viral attacks. Uh, in fact, I brought a little model of what a CRISPR-Cas9 system looks like, and it's probably uh, what you see here is a Cas9 protein, which is the molecular scissors wrapped around DNA, and it finds a way to cut the DNA in a specific place using a barcode. So this is a system that Dr. Emmanuel Charpentier and Dr. Jennifer Doudna uh, discovered and developed in the 2010-2011 timeframe. Uh, and they adapted this to be able to edit genes or DNA in any location across all genomes, whether it's animal genomes, plant genomes, or human genomes. And this was a remarkable discovery and development that spurred the, uh, the potential for CRISPR-Cas9 to make a huge impact in medicine. Uh, and CRISPR Therapeutics, our company was formed on the basis of access to this technology. That's very helpful, Sam. So please de describe CTX001 and how you are using CRISPR to cure sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. Sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia are terrible diseases. These are genetic diseases, in other words, they're diseases caused by mutations in the genome that are passed on from parents that have been carrying it. Uh, in sickle cell disease, uh, you have one mutation in the code of life that causes hemoglobin molecules to polymerize and cause the red blood cells to form a sickle shape that don't flow well within the arteries and veins and cause pain, cause strokes, and ultimately early death. Uh, Beta thalassemia is also an equally deadly disease that's seen across all parts of the Mediterranean and also in various parts of Asia and Africa. Uh, CTX001 is a medicine that utilizes CRISPR-Cas9 DNA editing to potentially cure sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. And the way we do this is we take the patient's bone marrow cells, send it to our manufacturing facility, where we make an edit using CRISPR-Cas9 in a particular place in the genome, and that elevates fetal hemoglobin, which is an alternative form of hemoglobin that makes up for the deficiency or defectiveness of beta globin. Beta, uh, and, and when you put these edited cells back into the patients, uh, they should be symptom-free and cured within a month or two of being transplanted um, with these modified cells. In fact, uh, last year, uh, one of the patients we treated, Victoria Gray, was a subject of an NPR story and article. This is a woman who is 34 years old at the time of being treated with three children, living a life of pain uh, and, uh, and a, a life where you have the constant threat that you may have hospitalizations. And she had seven hospitalizations coming per year coming into the, into the trial. And after treatment with CTX001, uh, after a couple of months, She's been symptom-free since, and now we've followed that patient close to two years, and that effect has been durable, and she's living a normal life, uh, going from a life of pain uh, and comorbidities. 
Just incredible, Sam, really amazing. And it's so interesting that you're using the patient's own cells to actually cure them. Now you recently reported what I think were just remarkable data at the American Society of Hematology meeting. Maybe you can walk us through some of this data and show us really about how long these responses are occurring. Um, we were very pleased to present data last year um, at this meeting where we showed data for 10 patients that we treated with CTX001. And remarkably, and three, uh, three of the patients were sickle cell, seven patients were, were suffering from severe uh, thalassemia. And remarkably, all 10 of 10 patients were symptom-free within two to three months after being treated with CTX001. Uh, and what we saw was that their fetal hemoglobin levels went up as predicted uh, to overcome this deficiency or defectiveness of beta globin. Um, and clinically, you know, these patients went from requiring in the thalassemia case, one to two transfusions per month to not requiring transfusions at all. And in the case of sickle cell disease, these patients who were being hospitalized and having to go to the emergency department every two, three months, um, and they went from that situation to not having to go to the hospital at all. Um, while these data are early, uh, we see we tremendous potential from an approach like this uh, to potentially provide cures to these patients suffering from these terrible diseases. Absolutely incredible. And the thing that I think is really important too is that you are fundamentally changing these patients' lives and there's all of the long-term effects that are gonna be relevant with these, with addressing the underlying disease. What do you see as the potential regulatory path here? And what are your goals to really bring CTX-001 to patients around the globe? Yeah, one thing I will say is, you know, it takes a village to bring a new technology platform like this to patients uh, globally. Um, and it requires the support of regulators, the health system, um, and it, it takes a lot of effort uh, from the company side, and but also the, the physicians treating for these patients and patients themselves. Um, I would say that we're operating with a great sense of urgency to get these uh, CTX001 to approval and ultimately to, come, uh, to get to patients across the globe. Uh, with, with therapies like this, where the effect size is so large, you know, it's almost binary, you get, you know, you're potentially going to get a cure after one treatment. You don't need to do trials with hundreds of patients. I mean, these are smaller trials, and we're already at the stage where we're in a pivotal trial, uh, which which potentially could be registrational. And so, if you get to approval with this trial, we would move very quickly to expand our manufacturing, scale up our manufacturing, not just in the U.S. and Western Europe, but across the globe, and bring this to patients in a safe and effective manner. That's great. Now, Sam, what are some other diseases that could be treated with CRISPR technology? One of the things we're very excited about is, is the uh, area of cancer. Uh, it's been nearly 60 years since we declared this modern war on cancer. And we try to throw um, all the medicines that we had at our disposal to try and make a, you know, to cure cancer or make a dent in, in patients suffering from cancer. But it still remains a death sentence in, in for most forms of cancer. Um, what's exciting about the CRISPR-based approach is you're retraining your immune cells to fight the cancer. So what we do is we take immune cells from a healthy 25, 30 year old um, and send them to our manufacturing facility. And there we use CRISPR-Cas9 to modify the DNA and we retrain these immune cells to go recognize a particular form of cancer. And once we inject these cells into the patient's body, they go and find the cancer where the cancer is lodged and, and kill the cancer cells. And we saw some very exciting early data last, that we presented last year uh, with the first 11 patients suffering from um, a blood cancer, uh, where we saw that these uh, allogeneic uh, retrained immune cells can, uh, called CAR-Ts can go kill these cancers. And so we're now pushing forward aggressively across a number of different cancer types where we have these re-engineered and retrained uh, immune cells. And I think that's gonna have a dramatic impact on cancer um, because we're now talking about uh, an intelligent drug. You know, it's, it's, it's no longer some toxic chemical where you're losing your hair and you, you have a lot of other toxic side effects. You have a smart drug that's a cell that's been programmed 
just kill the cancer and, not, and do nothing else in the in the human body. Um, and so we're quite excited about moving forward our, our, our trials here. And we've now dosed a number of patients and we hope to update further this year and next. Yeah, we're looking forward to more data from those programs. What about the field of regenerative medicine? How can CRISPR technology be applied to treat some diseases in that area? This is another exciting area uh, where you can, regenerative medicine means that you can literally regenerate organs that are defective. So if you have a defective kidney or defective liver, today you have to go into this long queue to find an organ that can be transplanted into your body. And most patients actually don't find a donor or an organ that can be transplanted. Uh, what we're doing here is synthetically creating these organs based on uh, pluripotent stem cells and engineering them uh, to form the organ of interest. In our case, our first foray is in diabetes, uh, where we take uh, these pluripotent stem cells and direct their fate to become pancreatic islet cells. Our pancreas are typically a banana-shaped organ uh, where uh, most of the cells are doing a different function, but a small percent of the cells are islet cells that produce insulin in response to glucose in our, in our bodies. Uh, and when those cells uh, become defective uh, for various reasons, they're no longer producing insulin. So patients become insulin dependent, uh, and these are severe diabetic patients that have to inject themselves every other day or every week. What we're doing here is taking these stem cells, making artificial pancreas, and putting them in a small device the size of a matchstick and implanting that device into your flanks under your skin. It's a very simple procedure. And then those cells live and grow inside your body and serve as your new pancreas, and that can sec secrete insulin in response to glucose. And, that's a, and, and that should be a durable solution for a number of years. Um, while it's still in preclinical stage, we're tremendously excited about this approach, and we're going to start working in the liver. We're going to ultimately start working uh, in, in the area of heart disease as well. And uh, this notion of regenerating organs is going to be very powerful in medicine. Uh, 10, 15 years down the line. Yeah, and you can really see how CRISPR technology represents the future of medicine. So Sam, with such powerful technology, how do you ultimately see CRISPR changing medicine? It's gonna change medicine uh, in a couple of ways. Um, in fact, I will use the words transform medicine. One, I think there's thousands of rare diseases where people are born with a single mutation or a couple of mutations that happen and it's unfortunate for those patients. Uh, and they're born with these rare diseases that are uh, oftentimes deadly. In fact, one of the diseases we're working on, for instance, is called uh, glycogen storage disease, 1A, where babies that are born with this disease have to be fed cornstarch every three to four hours throughout their life. And if, they're, if they miss that, they could die. Um, and it's very difficult for the parents. It's very difficult for the, the, the babies and the kids suffering from these diseases. And there are thousands of these diseases. And using CRISPR, you have the potential now to stamp out these diseases and give all these uh, people or patients a normal life. So that's one way to transform, transform medicine. The second is medicine's gonna feel very different, whether it's heart disease or cancers uh, or even neurodegenerative diseases. You know, I think today we're used to a world where we're taking chronic pills and medicines uh, every day or every week that only treat the symptoms and not the underlying disease sometimes. And here we're talking about uh, a, a new world of cures, you know, and you're gonna come in for a one-time procedure uh, akin to the medical device world today where let's say you have faulty hips and you come in for a hip replacement. Uh, you come in here uh, for a single procedure where either you replace the bone marrow or insert a new organ into your body um, or engineer or inject these smart uh, immune cells into your body to treat different diseases. And that one time procedure should hopefully yield a cure for these patients suffering from these deadly diseases. Uh, it's really gonna change how we think about medicine, but it's gonna be, it's gonna require an effort from the regulators, the health systems, the insurance companies, um, and the entire ecosystem to make sure that we can bring these transformative medicines to patients, not just in the developed world, but the entire world uh, so that we can change the lives of these patients. Yeah, so it sounds like the promise of not just living longer, but also living more healthy. 
Sam, thank you so much for being with us today. It's just incredible the work that you and all of the employees and all of your researchers and physicians are doing. So thank you for your hard work and thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Ted.